This talk is called Social Justice and Critical Thinking. It has nothing to do with uh, the work of Albert Camus, but um, um, another one of my passionate interests is what's known as practical ethics or applied ethics. Um, and this is sort of a subject that I'll be talking about today. A um, little bit of background about me. Um, I have been interested in social justice issues for long, long time, since I was a kid, in fact. Um, I remember learning that um, my parents had marched in a civil rights protest against racial segregation in northern New Jersey back in the mid-60s and been arrested. And I was so proud. Uh, and I remember marching as well in anti-Vietnam War protests in 1969 and 1971. Um, but since I have come to Edinburgh University, 2004, um, I have focused um, on three broad groups of issues. They aren't the only ones. Social justice issues. Um, one of them is a, a range of issues concerning racial justice. I'll talk more about some specific ones later on. I won't mention them now to save time. Uh, gender justice, women's rights, um, and perhaps especially LGBT uh, rights issues, LGBT justice issues. In fact, in the last couple of years, especially transgender rights issues, which I knew almost nothing about until relatively recently. Um, I'm also a professor who teaches courses in critical thinking. Uh, in fact, a little bit of self-marketing in the spring. I'll be teaching Philosophy 327, Beginning Logic, and it's about 80% critical thinking. Those of you that have taken my English 102 or are taking it now, research writing and live to tell, well, now I spend time on critical thinking in that course as well. Although all philosophy courses are critical thinking courses to some degree. Um, I should say something about what I mean by critical thinking. Um, there are different definitions available. And what I have in mind is something like the following. Um, it's reflection on some claim or issue uh, in which the reflection is directed at finding the truth and um, uh, involves guidance by evidence, so evidence-based deliberation on issues so as to get to the truth. What this involves, at least in part, is a willingness to uh, examine and consider alternative views, um, especially on issues in fields such as ethics, politics, and religion, in which there's so much controversy, so much disagreement, um, it also involves a willingness to doubt your own, to call into question your own beliefs, even cherished beliefs, as well as others' beliefs, and therefore to be or to try to be open-minded. Um, and there's a broader point here um, that has to do with what you might call perhaps a bit pretentiously intellectual integrity. It's so easy to stay in your comfort zone and retain beliefs you were taught to believe by good people, taught to hold by good people, usually your parents, um, uh, who might be upset if you changed your beliefs, the ones they taught you to hold. Um, but if you genuinely care about the truth, you have a respect for the truth, then as a critical thinker, you need to be willing to take the risk of um, thinking through issues in ways that could lead you to change your views about them um, and even lead you to be upsetting to people that you care about. That's one important value I suggest, respect for the truth. And another name for it is intellectual integrity. We all fail to live up to this value, this ideal. Nobody achieves it perfectly. I certainly don't. But the willingness to try is what distinguishes critical thinkers from other people who are more complacent about retaining their pre-existing beliefs um, and not exposing them to alternatives, not calling them into question, not offering evidence to support them, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's all leading up to my topic today, um, the need for critical thinking in discussions of social justice issues. Social justice issues tend to be very emotional. I certainly get emotional about them. Um, they tend to be issues about which people do not want to hear different perspectives, um, especially perspectives that 
are offensive to them. Um, there are issues about which it's all too tempting to form one's views dogmatically and then cling to them rigidly. Um, and that way of thinking and talking about social justice issues is antithetical to critical thinking. And so often we get into discussions with people of these issues and um, the discussions are confused. Um, they're unfair to other positions. Um, they're not very um, thoughtful. And the chances of arriving at the truth in such discussions I would suggest are minimal. So that if you do care about arriving at the truth, then it's important to avoid confusion in discussions, even of issues about which you're passionate, and to try to be fair to others who hold different positions and to be willing to listen to them, as well as to give them your views if they're willing to listen to you. And if they're not willing to listen to you, then they're not worth talking with. I would add as well that sometimes engaging in critical thinking about social justice issues will lead you in directions you don't want to go. And that can be really painful. Um, it's more tempting to take shortcuts and avoid hard questions, avoid counter evidence and that sort of thing. Um, and often you'll be questioned by people who are on your side in some worthy cause designed to achieve social justice or to promote it. And they'll criticize you for wanting to be fair to your opponents or to look for further evidence or to question bad arguments for good causes. And I suggest that the appropriate reply to them is to say, look, I value social justice as much as you do, but I also value critical thinking and I think it's extremely important that we live in a society that promotes it. I said to one of my classes, and it sort of slipped out by accident, that if we cultivate in our own society practices that are um, inconsistent with critical thinking, we end up electing people like Donald Trump. I didn't mean to say it in that class of mine, but I certainly believed it when I said it and I believe it now. And I'll say more words about that when I get to the end of my talk. Let me turn finally to um, the, really the heart of this presentation. I wanna talk about some specific issues in social justice and to illustrate why I think we need to approach them from the perspective of critical thinking um, and not just go with our guts or um, be guided by our emotions. Let me start with racial profiling, um, which is certainly relevant to the broader issue that I mentioned of racial justice. I'm in general a fairly passionate opponent of racial profiling, um, but I do take the issue seriously. What I find all too often is that when people who like me oppose racial profiling, discuss it, they resort to, well, shortcuts. Uh, for example, they dismiss defenders of racial profiling as bigots. Some defenders are bigots and some of them are not. How could you not be a bigot and support racial profiling? Simple answer, because you're convinced by an argument that doesn't require racism or other forms of bigotry. And the argument is one that's familiar to virtually any police officer or person who works in law enforcement, and we can call it the crime-fighting argument. And it goes like this. Unfortunately, there are certain racial or ethnic groups that are disproportionately likely to commit certain kinds of crimes. It doesn't mean that most crimes uh, of those kinds are committed by members of those groups. But um, for some particular crimes, for example, um, violent street crimes. There are particular groups, and in this case, unfortunately, one of them is Afri young African-American men who are more likely to commit such crimes for complicated social and economic reasons um, that I don't mean to slight, um, than you would expect based on their percentage of the population. The proportion of people who commit violent street crimes um, 
who are black is higher than the percentage of Americans who are black. That's a fact. It's a really unfortunate fact, and I wish it weren't true, but it's a fact that defenders of racial profiling are aware of, and if you ignore it, they will use it against you, and you will have nothing to say except to call them names. Opponents of racial profiling, and again, I am one of them, especially as regards police profiling of African Americans, and especially as regards police profiling of young black men, which I take to be a common across the country, extremely unfair, and extremely harmful, need to be willing to come to terms with this fact, to explain it, and to argue that despite this fact, racial profiling is still a really rotten idea an unjust practice. I should mention as well that one can be passionately opposed to racial profiling directed against African Americans and Latinos and so on, and still, if one wishes, make room for limited uses of it without being some kind of raving bigot. I'm actually undecided on this particular issue, but I take, for example, the practice that you find in airports across the US in which um, TSA employees pay special attention to the, to the person and the luggage of perceived Middle Eastern travelers. Why do they do that? Do they hate Middle Easterners? No, in general, no. They do it for reasons you're familiar with that have to do with fear of terrorist bombs on American planes that take many, many innocent lives. You can make a case against this kind of profiling, but if it's done in a relatively unintrusive way, special pat-downs, that kind of thing, not locking people up in internment camps, as President George W. Bush did, to 5,000 American Muslims back in 2001 and 2002, if it's done in a relatively unintrusive way, um, you can make a case that it's justified. I'm, again, I'm sure about that. I'm pretty sure that racial profiling of African Americans is a terrible idea and terribly unfair. I'm not sure whether a very limited kind of profiling of perceived Middle Easterners um, or perceived Muslims um, is entirely unjustified in airports. But if you're not willing to address these issues openly and honestly, then there's no way you're going to get to a reasonable conclusion about what we should be doing. Different example also involving racial justice. The Black Lives Matter movement <coughs> has, um, has arisen in the last couple of years. I am a strong supporter of it. Um, I'm very concerned about unjustified police violence against African Americans, though it's hard to get good data, in part because police departments don't keep good data of this kind. Um, but I'm not willing to, to, to issue blanket condemnations of police conduct that leads to violence or involves violence against African Americans um, without an examination of each case, one at a time. I think it's extraordinarily unfair and unreasonable to assume in advance that whenever a young black man is killed by a police officer, especially a white one, a racist act of unjustified police action must have occurred. You've got to examine the details. And often you will find, it seems to me, that the most reasonable conclusion is an unjustified act of police violence did occur for racial or other reasons. But the devil is in the details. I do not know what happened in the Michael Brown case in Ferguson, Missouri, and I doubt anybody does in this room. There's a lot of complex issues arising about that case. I am agnostic about it. Was the officer justified in shooting him? I don't know. Was the officer a racist? Probably. We've got some evidence for that, but that doesn't mean he wasn't justified. It's hard to tell. There are other kinds of cases where the evidence seems much clearer. The Walter Scott case in South Carolina is, west, is less well known. By the way, it's just going to trial now. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, an African-American man um, with uh, unpaid child support uh, uh, um, in his record is approached by a white officer. 
There's some kind of unfilmed confrontation. We don't know exactly what happened. What we do, do know, because of the recording on a cell phone from a bystander, is that Walter Scott was running away from the officer with his back to him, was unarmed and was shot at eight times. Five bullets struck and he was killed. <coughs> he was unarmed, he was running away, and he posed no threat to anyone. None. And then the officer walked over to the dead body and dropped something next to it, probably the officer's own taser, so that he could later argue that he'd been tasered by the man. That is an outrage from where I sit, though the trial remains to be conducted. And it's possible that there'll be some convincing reason that the officer's lawyers offer to defend him against the charge of murder because it sure looks like murder to a lot of people, and not just Walter Scott's family, and not just members of the Black Lives Matter movement. And there are other cases like that. Eric Garner in New York City, Shamir Rice in Cleveland, Philander Castile. I forget where that one happened, but that one just went to trial too. <coughs> case by case, no blanket generalizations. Case by case is harder than just generalizing about a variety of complex issues. But I never said critical thinking was easy. Likewise, although I strongly support the Black Lives Matter movement, I don't support everything anybody ever does who has some connection to that movement when apparent supporters of the movement shout down public speakers. I think they're behaving badly. They should shut up and listen and ask questions in the same civil manner as everybody else. Free speech is another important value, along with racial justice and along with critical thinking. There are a lot of important values to cherish. And social justice is an especially important one of them, but that doesn't mean anything goes in promoting it. And finally, if it's true, and I'm not sure if it is, that some Black Lives Matter supporters in New York City and elsewhere did some midnight chanting about killing cops, then that's despicable, absolutely despicable. And all genuine supporters of the BLM movement should condemn them. This is not what the movement is about. And there's nothing disloyal to the movement about saying that there are members of it or supporters of it who are really messed up even though it's easier just to give your blanket approval. I'm probably talking for too long already. Let me move on quickly to gender justice. Uh, I teach gender issues in a lot of classes. I've taught women's studies classes. I'm a feminist. I believe that women deserve and aren't getting equal opportunities. But I'm not willing to support all feminist goals and all feminist activities, regardless of how well supported they are by evidence. And let me give you some examples. I know a lot of feminists, among others, will tell you that women make 79 cents on the dollar compared to men in the US. It's in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's an official datum. And that shows that women are paid 21% less than men for discriminatory reasons. Actually, it shows no such thing, not even close. What the BLS data actually tell us about the gender gap in wages is that women average, full-time working women average 21 cents less than full-time working men. And that's not the same thing as saying that the gap is due entirely to discrimination. In fact, it's well known among economists, including feminist economists, that there are other factors that help to create the wage gap besides discrimination. One of them, for example, is the fact that on average, men work longer hours. They work more hours per week than women do. Um, they often have more of an education or higher qualifications for certain kinds of jobs. 
They tend to have fewer child care responsibilities. No big surprises there. There are a whole host of factors that have little directly to do with gender discrimination and pay that help to explain the gender gap in wages. And what thoughtful pro-feminist economists will tell us is that it's about 92 cents on the dollar that women make compared to men when you take into account these other factors. And even the remaining eight cents are not necessarily explainable in terms of discrimination. There's further details to be considered. Okay. I do believe that women face gender discrimination in the workplace in many ways, and that one of those ways is being shortchanged by employers because of their gender, especially by the way if they're mothers. They seem to fare the worst compared to fathers, for example. But I'm not willing to pretend that there's a 21 cent wage gap that's entirely due to discrimination based on gender. That's just false. And let me tell you that conservatives and others who have doubts about feminism will bring that fact up very quickly. You give them misinformation, they will call you on it. They're not stupid. Well, maybe a few. <clears throat> the kind that boast about sexual assault on public videos. Um, they're stupid. Um, let's see. Um, sexual violence is a sensitive issue. We always talk about it in my women's studies classes. Um, it's really hard to get good data on campus rape and sexual assault. Um, there have been a variety of studies. A lot of them have been faulty. The one in four figure for women, campus, uh, women who are college students who are sexually assaulted or raped while in college was discredited for a time, now it's back. One in five looks to be the most reliable figure, though there's more research to be done, okay, for sure. Um, what you'll find from conservatives, by the way, is a one in 40 figure. Where do they get that from? From a federal study in about 2002 that examined not surveys of college women, but reports to campus police or other police. And then you get a low figure, one in 40. It is extraordinarily dishonest to rely on reported campus sexual assaults and rapes. Because as you probably know, rape and sexual assault is the kind of crime that is grossly underreported and for obvious reasons. Misinformation is out there. Don't be fooled, but you've got to do the work. You've got to find reliable sources. And reliable sources do not include advocacy groups in general, though I give my money to some of them because they're partisan, whether from the left or the right. One last point about um, women's rights and gender justice. Um, abortion is such a sensitive issue. I teach it in a variety of my classes. I've taught it on and off for decades in my career. Um, and what I find is that it's such an emotional issue, it tends to bring out the most irrational arguments and emotional ones that you can find um, from both sides, from both sides. Um, since I'm pro-choice myself, and staunchly so, I'll start with the pro-choice side. Um, I don't know how many people I've heard um, say about people that are pro-life and anti-choice on abortion. Oh, they just think that women should be baby machines. That's what's going on with them. They don't believe in, in that women should have equal rights compared to men. Uh, um, they're sexists. They're um, Christian fanatics or whatever. And of course, there are people who are pro-life pro and anti-choice about abortion who are like that. And there are a hell of a lot who aren't. A hell of a lot who aren't. And there's nothing about being pro-life and anti-choice that requires anyone to think that women are baby machines designed by God just to pump out babies. It's a very rare view. <clears throat> are the Duggars off TV now? 19 kids. All right, a little humor. Lighten up, okay? Um, 
my students will tell you that my jokes are terrible. Some of them are just wincing right now as I speak. Um, and of course, there are people who think that um, abortion, all abortion, is baby killing. Favorite label, right? Um, and it's important to keep in mind the facts of fetal development. Most abortions occur in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. And during that time, the fetus is absolutely minuscule in the earliest abortions that are done um, therapeutically through medication uh, or pharmaceuticals. What you've got is a zygote or embryo. There ain't no baby. There's a potential baby, but there's not an actual baby. Or at least now we need arguments that zygotes and embryos are babies. And good luck with that. It's so tempting to appeal to people's emotions. The women are baby machines caricature of the pro-life view and the um, supporter of baby killing caricature of pro-choice people. We can do better than that. And we should do better than that. But that requires listening to the other side and not just caricaturing it or insulting it. Um, jumping ahead a bit, Finally, to um, LGBT rights, because I'm conscious that I'm talking for too long. <laughs> There's so many issues here. I know I've given talks on same-sex marriage, and I'm so happy that that battle has been won. By the way, Donald Trump apparently announced today that the Supreme Court ruling requiring legal recognition of same-sex marriage across the country is settled law. He's not going to challenge it. And presumably not going to appoint justices to the court that would challenge it. While Roe v. Wade on abortion is not settled law, according to Trump. Okay. Um, having said that, um, and being as happy as I am for my LGBT friends, who are able to marry the individuals they love despite long-standing social disapproval and legal obstacles. I don't assume for a minute that people who are against same-sex marriage are homophobic bigots. That's really tempting too, to suppose that your opponents on sensitive issues are just bigots. We've seen that in connection with racial profiling, and I want to mention it in connection with LGBT issues. I think that there are sincere, thoughtful, humane people who have gay friends, who wish the best for their gay friends, who acknowledge the reality of same-sex relationships as genuine, loving, dignified relationships, but think for some reason or other that same-sex marriage should not be legally recognized. I'm not going to call them all a bunch of bigots, even though most of my LGBT friends do. I remember asking my sister, um, who's a passionate advocate and has been for years of same-sex marriage, well, what about President Obama? Back then he was against same-sex marriage, or at least he said he was. Is he a bigot? And she said, um, yeah, he's just a nice bigot. Um, she voted for him twice. Um, nice bigot as he was. Um, my view is that people who oppose same-sex marriage are seriously mistaken but I don't think that makes them bigots. It depends on their reasons. And sometimes their reasons are interesting and thoughtful, though to my mind, misguided. Um, one last example, and then I'll wrap things up. Um, I skipped over some stuff as a gesture of mercy. Transgender rights. Um, I'll be giving, I actually gave a talk on campus and also at Preco last spring on transgender rights and bathroom bills. I'll be giving much the same talk in Toronto next summer, only I'll call it um, transgender rights and restroom bills uh, because I believe in Canada, bathrooms are for bathing. Um, they're not for that other stuff. Um, and I, this too is a very emotional issue. I've looked through the arguments from um, people who claim that transgender 
women who used to be men, or to consider themselves men, uh, um, should not be allowed to use women's restrooms. I've looked over the arguments really carefully. And often they involve, involve genuine concern about safety for, for um, non-transgender, that is cisgender, women and girls using women's or girls' restrooms. Um, I think the arguments don't work. I think, in fact, they're, they're largely hysterical. There's a lot of evidence to show that they're unwarranted. Um, but I don't think that someone who raises such concerns is a transphobic bigot. It depends on the individual. There are a lot of transphobic bigots out there, people for whom transgender people are just disgusting. And those people are grotesquely ignorant about what it means to be transgender. They have a lot to learn. But there are other people, including, by the way, some feminists, some feminist women, and some of them are friends of mine, especially some radical feminist women, who have serious concerns about um, allowing transgender women to use women's restrooms. And the concerns can't be dismissed in many cases as uh, phobia about transgender people, though there is that kind of phobia among some radical feminists. I should add as well that when radical feminists raise concerns, as they do about how we identify somebody as genuinely transgender, and they say things like, it can't just be a matter of how you feel. Oh, I feel like I'm a woman, so I'm a woman. I think that's a legitimate concern. I think the nature of gender identity is very, very complicated. And I think that when feminists and others raise concerns about what the criteria are for identifying someone as having a particular gender identity, like being a male to female transgender woman, those concerns need to be addressed without name calling. We've seen analogous cases arise in connection with race. If someone identifies herself as a black woman, but by every other indication, she's white. Is she a black woman because she feels like one? Most of us would say, hell no. There are even people who claim to be disabled and use wheelchairs who are not actually physically disabled, but they identify so strongly with disabled people, people with disabilities, that they want to be a member of the community of disabled people. Should we just take their word for it? No. At least we need some serious discussion when it comes to gender identity, disability identity, racial or ethnic identity. These are serious and difficult issues. And calling somebody a bigot for raising the issues is unfair. All too often people are, inc attempt, are inclined to shut down discussions with others by calling them names. And that, I suggest, is antithetical to critical thinking and, frankly, to common decency, or what ought to be common decency. Now I'll wrap it up, finally. Um, two points in my conclusion. By the way, um, we were supposed to have handouts for you guys that were copies of my outline. Did you guys get them? You did? Okay, good. If you didn't, you can email me, and I'll send you one. Um, the first point is this. My, my crack about Donald Trump was actually quite serious. When people systematically confine their information sources to a limited array of sources and cut themselves off from rep reputable sources, like fact checkers of a nonpartisan kind, they let themselves be deceived by demagogues and con men. Not everybody that voted for Donald Trump is a dupe of a demagogue or a con man. But I'll tell you, I know a hell of a lot of people who are. They have no idea what's really going on in this country. They accept crude, ignorant stereotypes of minority groups like Mexicans and Muslims and African Americans. 
they believe a man who is a pathological liar, as has been demonstrated by nonpartisan fact checkers over and over and over and over again. By the way, what about Hillary? She's a garden variety political liar, in my perhaps not so humble opinion. When you jettison critical thinking, you make stupid decisions sooner or later about whom to vote for. And a lot of Americans made some really stupid voting decisions in this last election. And they and we are going to pay the price. I am really sorry to say. And my final point, which may seem hypocritical, as passionate as I get about social justice issues and presidential elections, I do try really hard to be fair to my opponents. I fail a lot, but I try. When photos of Donald Trump giving what was supposed to be a Nazi salute were circulated in the media last year, my reaction was, this is bogus. And I checked it out, and you know what? It was bogus. Absolutely fraudulent. The man has many faults, but he's not a Nazi. And he's not stupid enough to do Nazi salutes in public. He was actually doing this, taking an oath and asking his audience to take an oath as well, right? And when friends of mine posted on Facebook the Nazi salute meme, I said, you're tripping. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. Even pathological liars have a right not to be slandered with viciously false information. And I meant it, and I mean it, and I believe it now. And that's part of the fair-mindedness that I think goes with critical thinking. Let me stop talking and ranting and take your questions.